Welcome to the Rector's Forum. My name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Rector. Uh, it is great to have everybody here as we're coming in. If you're new to this community, we would love to learn more about you and have you learn more about us. There are green contact sheets near both doors, and please take a moment to give us uh, your contact information. Uh, the restrooms are around the corner over there. We have exits there and there. Your nearest exit may be behind you, uh, so please note that. Uh, at all times, we put our faith into action here at All Saints Church, and uh, every week we pick one thing to really focus our action. Uh, this week at the action table, we are inviting you to sign a letter to our member of Congress supporting H.R. 6, the Dream and Promise Act of 2019. Um, this would put about 2.7 million immigrants immediately in a much better and secure position um, so they can just have a level of stability, uh, those among us who are uh, immigrants, to start their lives. And so many of the things that people like me who, um, I'm not a first generation immigrant, take for granted. And so we need to sign a letter uh, to our senators and to your representative letting, we know, letting them know that we support this vigorously. And speaking of vigorous support, we also have a huge thank you card to Governor Newsom. Uh, for putting a moratorium on the death penalty in California, and we want to sign that to him and continue to appreciate the work he's doing and urge him uh, to go further. Um, as always, your generosity in so many ways is what fuels this community. Um, and if you uh, have pledged for 2019, we thank you so much for doing that. Uh, if you haven't, there is still time, and you can uh, see me. Uh, or Terry Knowles or Marianne Ryan uh, for a pledge card. And if you're online, it's super easy. There's a button right below where you're looking at me right now that says <laughs> donate. Just click right there. No gift is too small or too large. Uh, so please do that and know that you're a part of uh, everything that's happening here at All Saints Church. Um, it is an incredible joy to welcome back here, um, I'm trying to get this in the right order, the very Reverend Canon Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, um, who is canon at Washington National Cathedral and dean of Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, and an amazing author, writer, preacher, and theologian, uh, and friend of All Saints Church. Um, and instead of me going on and on about uh, everything that she is and has done, I will say that you can afterwards buy some of her books, which are incredible, uh, here at the book table. Um, and instead, I'm going to let you get to know her through our conversation. And so will you please welcome again Kelly Brown Douglas. So some of us here were here with, uh, with you yesterday. Um, and we spent just an amazing three hours together. And you spent some time looking at the world around us and, and ask, you asked the question to start with, how did we get here and why do we keep getting here? And, and, and you took us on this incredible historical tour of the relationship between whiteness and anti-blackness. And I know I'm asking you to condense like two and a half hours into a couple <laughs> minutes, but can you just sort of summarize some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I guess in brief, one would just say that what we have to recognize is that one of the, or the, one of the foundations of this country uh, has been a foundation to preserve this notion of the exceptionalism of a certain people and the exceptionalism of a people that have been deemed in Anglo-Saxons uh, white. And so that from the very beginning, our founders had in mind this concept that our country would indeed be a city on the hill, but as a city on the hill, it would be a beacon to American exceptionalism that was synonymous with Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Uh, to, so that is embedded into the very DNA of our nation which puts our nation in conflict with itself in many respects, because the interesting thing is, is that not only uh, were the founding fathers committed to this notion of American exceptionalism as Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, but they also came up with the idea, they had this vision of a nation that was a land of justice and freedom for, 
for all. Mm -hmm. And so you see this conflict, what I like to say, sort of this warring soul within the founding fathers themselves, which is embedded within the fabric of our very nation. And so that is a part of our collective consciousness, this sense of whiteness uh, that is America. And so that's why it, it continues to emerge and reemerge. And the thing that we have to understand is when we think of this sense of whiteness, this construct of whiteness, that it is a construct construct that only has a reality in opposition. Mm. It's an oppositional construct. And so when we talk about whiteness, we are talking about that which is over and against the, that which is non-white. Uh, and so when we, that's why we see in this country whiteness, as I like to say, standing its ground or acting out against, over and against anything that opposes it, that which is non-white, because whiteness only exists in opposition to the other. Uh, to, that's how it came to be. And it exists in that respect, so to protect this myth of our country as an Anglo-Saxon exceptionalist uh, nation, because we all know that everybody, as I always say, that looks like an Anglo-Saxon isn't actually an Anglo-Saxon, but what they have in common is the mask of whiteness. Uh, duh. And so this is, this is who we are as a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is this that continues to haunt us. And it will continue to haunt us until we own it. And until we decide who we really want to be. If we want to be that nation that is the city of, on the hill showing forth its anglo saxonist exceptionalism in quotes. Or are we going to be that nation that is indeed a land where everybody can live free and live into the fullness of their being? Are we going to live into the better angels of our founders? Or are we going to live into the whiteness uh, of our founders? Uh, it seems to me on most accounts they lived into their whiteness, but they did have a vision. And so this is where we are. So, I mean, you don't have to look around much and see just this pervasive reality of anti-blackness. And I think it's so um, good you define whiteness as always being oppositional. Um, what's also evident is that other racial groups that don't fit into whiteness are also suffering intense discrimination. So when you talk about whiteness and anti-blackness, what do we say to Latinx, Asian, First Nation, and others who say, well, well yeah, what about me? What about us? And that's why, and as we talked about a little, uh, Bit yesterday, if not more than a little bit. That's why understanding this concept of white supremacy is very important. Mm -hmm. Because whiteness acts itself out in this notion of more than a notion through systems and structures and the ideology of white supremacy, mm -hmm. which is, of course, that uh, this derives itself from this notion of exceptionalism. And so white supremacy always acts itself out over that which is not white, over bodies that are not white. Anything that stands in opposition to that. And so when we talk about white supremacy, we can understand then why, uh, why our country is responding in such a way to brown bodies to uh, uh, much the same way that it responds to black bodies, to First Nation persons, to other persons. And then one would ask the question, so how, how, does, how do LGBTQ persons fit into this same oppositional reality? And this is why we have to understand that behind this notion of white supremacy, uh, whiteness itself, is this notion of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Because if we understand that, then what we are able to grasp is that anything that would indeed uh, be sort of challenge the notion of this exceptional, uh, of exceptionalism. And how was that exceptionalism defined? It was defined as white, as male, as landed, you know, meaning uh, wealth. And so, uh, when we, and, and heterosex, hetero. And so if we understand that, that whiteness then becomes not only the reality of whiteness itself, the particularity of whiteness itself, but whiteness then becomes this thing that negates Right, any, any 
human being, any body that doesn't fit into this underlying notion of what it means to be an American, an exceptional American. And we can understand what it means to be an exceptional American when we go back to our founding fathers, right? White, male, presumably heterosexual, and wealthy. Mm. Uh, uh, and so then that helps us to understand how this notion of white supremacy acts itself out against anything that would threaten the notion of American exceptionalism, of specialness. And so that's why it is important to understand what lies beneath in, in our country's very DNA, what lies beneath the uh, notion of white supremacy itself, and then we can understand, and in many respects, the bodies that then become black. Uh, uh, and those are those brown uh, bodies, those First Nation bodies, those bodies that uh, are other than that white male hetero body. Right, and so this puts into context something you said when you were here last time, and we were in this space, and you were standing over there, um, and you gave this incredible forum on when whiteness stands its ground in the church. And you said something that we had some conversations about here after you left, which is you said you can't be white and follow Jesus. And, and, yep. and so, which, which I, I think I want you to unpack that a little more, because I'm as Anglo-Saxon as they come. Um, and and, and I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Uh, so in the context of this, what do you mean when you say you can't be white and follow Jesus? Yeah, well, and I still say that and yep. say it even louder. Whiteness and Christianity just don't go together. And one of the ways, by the way, in which you can see that whiteness is this construct that somehow uh, blinds one to the possibilities of uh, the richness of whom God has created us to be and the possibilities of the fullness of the way in which we can live that out into this sort of just vision that is God's. And so what you see, what's interesting to me, when we look, for instance, and I'll get to the church, when we look, for instance, at Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and all of these other founding fathers, and that on the, in the same almost speech sometimes, Abraham Lincoln, uh, to who I always like to say really didn't free that many people, but uh, Abraham Lincoln, when we look at them almost within the same speeches, and certainly for Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson in the same treatise on the notes from the state of Virginia, he holds these two things that on the one hand, he really honors, because he says it, his Anglo-Saxon exceptionalist kind of heritage. And then on the other hand, he talks about this vision for freedom. Now, what is the problem here? The problem is this whiteness gets in the way, mm -hmm. that he can't let go of this human construct of whiteness that says to him that he's entitled in a way in which other people are not entitled. So this concept of whiteness gets in the way of us understanding who we are, nothing more, nothing less, sacred children of God. And that's pretty damn good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But whiteness blocks that. Mm -hmm. Because whiteness is a construct of privilege. It is a construct of exceptionalism. It is an oppositional construct, which means it stands in opposition to the realities of God's equal humanity. Amen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so in as much as it does that, it stands in opposition to the cross. Yeah. And in fact, it's a, as, a, as a symbol of, of that which oppresses and stands in opposition, Jesus lets it go on the cross. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so he lets every, any aspect of himself go that would indeed prevent him from not only going to the cross, because to go to the cross is to stand in utter solidarity, mm -hmm. utter solidarity with those people who are othered by any sense of mm -hmm. human exceptionalism, human special, of any sense of whiteness. And so in this regard, whiteness acts as this, not only does it mask the reality of who we really are, but it masks, it, 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 it prevents one from living into their own humanity. It blocks whiteness, you know, you know, you know, mm -hmm. People who not only look like white Americans, but act like white Americans, run around here like they're more than just dust, dirt, as my sister would say, dressed up dirt. You know, they run around here like they're more than that. Well, you ain't no more than that. 
but somehow whiteness allows one to think that, right? And so when you think that, you are certainly betraying who you are uh, as a child of God. And so that's why you can't be white and Christian. And as long as you own your whiteness, you aren't owning who you are as a sacred child of God. You are in fact betraying that. Yeah. So what I love about that is, you know, what following Jesus is for me is this liberation. And what it's liberating me from is my whiteness. That's and that's right. not about me, me changing the literal color of my no. skin. It is about freeing me from all that stuff that is imprisoning me. That's right. So I love that. Um, one of the things you talked about yesterday that really resonated with me, even though like I, I first sort of did one of these when you said it, was when you talked about the greatest power of oppression not being coercive, but being productive and discursive. And you said this, so that power creates the knowledge it needs to sustain itself. Um, and it's about how we create these systems that incarnate really these lies. Right. Um, that we then base our whole lives on. Um, we had a, uh, a retreat that from our Racial Justice Advisory Board yesterday morning, right before we came in uh, to, to, to listen and be in conversation with you. And one of the things that came up in that retreat was this, um, you know, someone said, you know, we just really have to face that we're a white church. Um, and and it, it, it occurs to me that we don't like to say that because we're a progressive white church and we don't like the way that sounds. Uh, and it makes us feel guilty and even ashamed. And so, uh, but what I, I felt you inviting us into was a conversation about power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think there is a tendency in uh, the progressive white church to think, about, uh, to think about race, to think about becoming beloved community, think about diversity and inclusion um, in terms of things that do not threaten the power structure. And so when we talk about progressive white churches being white church, it's about who controls the cultural identity of the community. Who, what are the images of the divine in art and music and discourse? Who controls what we believe is good liturgy? Um, who controls what we believe is appropriate behavior in church? Um, who is not just populating the organizational structures, but who actually defines how we organize ourselves? Um, you gave a really interesting statistic that rang so true and it was also horrifying that the Episcopal Church right now is 90% white, which is whiter than this country has been at its whitest. We're a white church. And I don't feel like that's the story we tell ourselves as a progressive Episcopal Church. We kind of want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to tell ourselves we can be progressive and inclusive without giving up the power and dismantling the structures of white supremacy. And I wonder if then we don't just become our own worst enemy because we should be the people um, as progressive white church who is most positioned to do the dismantling and the revolution. And instead, I think too often we settle for window dressing. Yep. And so I, I just like, I want to throw that out there and see what you think about that and get kind of your response. Well, you said a lot. I want to say amen, amen, amen. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> You know, one, as you've heard me say, and as I say a lot, just because you happen to look like a white American or look white don't mean you gotta act like it, mm -hmm. right? And so, so the first road to recovery mm -hmm. uh, is what you just did to own the whiteness and then to talk about so what does that mean? What does that look like? How, does, how do we act our whiteness out, mm -hmm. right? Even, and, and, and I want to stay with that for a minute, even when we think we aren't being white, but we're acting it out, right? right? And so even if we look around, I like the way you talk about cultural identity. What is, you don't have to have people of color in your church to, uh, be a church where you don't enact whiteness mm. as the culture of power, mm. right? You can be a church that reflects the uh, human creation that is God, even when you have a bunch of people in it that happen to look white, right? And so that has to do with the very things in which you've just spoken. Uh, what are the icons of God that we have in, uh, in our church? What are the stories we tell? Uh, what are the conversations 
we have? What are the liturgies that we embrace? Uh, what are the books we read to our children? Mm. Uh, to, how do we engage in the biblical narrative? Whose, whose story is it that we enter into when we read these uh, biblical stories? Uh, to, who's the missing person from the table? How, how, how do we preach? So uh, there is a way, obviously, and this is what we you know, sort of discursive power to disrupt the very narratives of, of whiteness uh, that, that we hold, that we culturally hold. Uh, and so a way to desanctify, if you will, whiteness mm -hmm. without having to have people of color in your church. Yeah. Because, when, because it's not the people of color get, that are going to make you less white and that's not their job. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> And as I said ye yesterday, you got your own work to do, and that work is to uh, sort of till the soil and uh, let go of the, the power of whiteness in your community so that when people of color happen by, happen by they go, oh, this is a church in which I can be, mm -hmm. and I don't have to make this church uh, uh, welcoming, be welcoming. The other thing when you talk about uh, the Episcopal Church and what we do so it is no accident that the Episcopal Church is, I don't know, somewhere between now, that statistic was 2014, so we're somewhere between 87%, I mean, it's no big difference, right? <laughs> between 87% and 90% white. Well, this is no accident. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident because the systems and structures of our church are systems and structures that indeed are, nurture that. They are meant to bring in white folks and not to bring in people of color. And so, you know, our, the systems and structures of our church work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one good thing we can say is, well, those Episcopal people know how to make systems and structures work and do the thing they're supposed to do, because they've done it. Mm -hmm. Look at our church. Uh, to, so now we have to begin to ask ourselves, well, my goodness, you know, if we want to be a church, because churches are supposed to ref, uh, be a glimpse of mm -hmm. God in the world, and we aren't that. Uh, we may be a smidgen, but we aren't mm -hmm. a glimpse of God in the world. If we want to do that, then what do we have to do to change the culture of our church and to dismantle the systems and structures that only welcome uh, white people, so I think, it's, which means we have to have hard conversations and churches on the ground mm -hmm. have to press our wider church to have those conversations. And the, if we want to talk about beloved community, mm -hmm. then we better recognize that if we're, we do not have the systems and structures that will allow us to be the beloved community. Mm -hmm. We just don't. And so if we want to talk about beloved community, that's a call and a challenge to our church. That is not some reality we can get to because we're going to sing Kumbaya together. Yeah. Uh, to some of us, I don't feel like singing Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you're right about that, dismantling those uh, systems and, and structures of the church. Uh, it was a final thing, but I uh, probably said enough. Well, uh, I doubt that. And, and um, one of the things that I find is a challenge, and it's for me personally, and it's for us as a white progressive church, is it feels like when we start encountering our own whiteness, yeah. the first place and the easiest place for us to go is a place of shame. And it's just not a helpful place, which is why I have to keep remembering what you say, which is this is about our liberation. Right. And that the central identity is that we're created in God's image and we're beautiful and we're powerful and we're good. And as a friend of mine likes to say, God has our picture on God's refrigerator. <laughs> um, and, and so... Um, this isn't, I mean, th that's why you know, I find it so helpful to distinguish between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I have done something bad, shame is I am bad. I am bad, that's right. And, and, and guilt can be helpful because guilt, we got, a, we got an app for that. It's called <laughs> reconciliation. Um, and, and, but shame, I've never found shame to be helpful. And, and yet I know I and we can go to that place so much, and it doesn't feel good. And then I know that that, that pain uh, can lead to anger, and, and I can be really resistant to when I'm feeling shamed. And so, you know, part of what we need to do as a community is just, you know, to start with, to have a foundation. Um, and it really is that view from the mountaintop that if you haven't heard the sermon you hear about, um, that, you know, we all are created in God's image as beautiful and powerful and good and delightful. 
and that this is about liberating ourselves from everything that prevents us from grasping that. Yeah, and I, th I think you're right, and I just want to get to add what you've said about the app mm -hmm. for guilt. The app for guilt will eventually get to reconciliation. That's way down okay, the way. Okay, go for it. But, but the app for guilt is this thing called repentance, mm -hmm. right? G and, and that's part of the process of that's reconciliation. Right. That's yeah. right. You got to have it for we. Right. We can't have this easy. And repentance is about uh, turning around mm -hmm. and doing something different. And so you know you got to repent of your whiteness. Mm -hmm. So the, and the, so and what yeah, does go. it look like to repent of your whiteness? And mm -hmm. that means to living out of something other than that construct of whiteness and doing something different. And it's okay, you know, it's, it's okay to mess up, uh, to, uh, you know, because it's not about perfection, it's about progress. Uh, to, uh, a feminist theologian talks about sort of uh, what you do is you're all, white, white people are just always in recovery. Uh, uh, and, right, and you know, and sometimes, you know, you mess up, you go, oh my gosh, why did I do that? It's okay. Just recognize it and get back on the road uh, uh, to recovery and, as, uh, and fail better the next time. Uh, but just stay on the road to, to progress. That's repentance. And so it's not enough, because, and repentance is different from I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then going on and doing everything that you were doing before. And so it's only through repentance that we move toward a justice that will, and see, I, reconciliation, reconciliation is that which comes automatically through justice. Mm -hmm. And so I'd rather name the road to, toward justice than the road toward reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Because when if we get to justice, then reconciliation is inevitable. Well, and, and when I talk about it, I mean, like, we have a theology of it in the church, which I find really helpful, which right. is, but there's stages to it. And, and it's like we did in, in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, we did like a, a service of like, conf, like repentance or whatever yeah. for, for the sin of, and it's like, wow, we really jumped a couple steps there. Because when you look at reconciliation, the first step is self-examination. Then there's confession. Then there's repentance and reparation and amendment of life. Right. And then you get to absolution. So it's, you know, it is a whole process um, that we go through. And, and it's a challenging, uncomfortable process. And it's such a life-giving, liberating process. Um, so we're talking about how we need really a revolution, a dismantling of systems. I um, was talking with Sharon Browse, who's the rabbi over at ECAR, just amazing. And she was telling me a, um, a piece of midrash about how a rabbi talked about how you can't build a house from a rotting timber, a rotting central timber. Um, and, and how in many ways uh, the country and our faith communities are, bought, are built with this central rotting timber, so what do we do with it? Hmm. And, and then I'm reminded of, of Gandhi saying, be the change you wish to see in the world. And so we look at our society and we look at this country and we, we know that make America great again means make America white again. And we know um, that we're trying to actually move, we are moving backwards in this. Um, well, here you and I are, and you're the dean of probably the most progressive seminary in the Episcopal Church. I'm the rector of maybe one of the most progressive large churches in the Episcopal mm -hmm. Church. Uh, what do we do? How can we, in our institutions and in our communities, be the change that we wish to see in the world. I'm not looking, that's like this is a conversation. I'm not looking you to give the only answer to that. But I'm wondering, if we can, we kick, can we kick this around for a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and yes. And, and it's one of the things I uh, must say, Mike, that just as you are as, uh, in this institution is, that we are committed to being. Mm -hmm. And that means, first of all, that we don't have all the answers of what that looks like. Uh, but we uh, know what it doesn't look like and some of the steps toward that. Uh, and I should say it's, it's in conversation with institutions like yours, with you, that we can discover the fullness of what that is. But, but I know this, that for us it means, one, not only trying to nurture the kind of leadership uh, that will be comfortable in these conversations, right? 
and will be comfortable uh, in working in settings uh, in crucify reality, crucifying realities. Uh, to, uh, that's, that will be comfortable not simply working in parishes but trying to be church in the world, right? Uh, and so we're very clear that we are trying to prepare students to be church, uh, which again is being the change we want to see. And so for this, that means just embodying our very values, uh, uh, and that's what it means to be church as well, to somehow be, we always say, the body of Christ in the world. Well, what's that look like? This is a crucified savior. As I said yesterday, the cross has to make a difference. Uh, and the cross means that we see always the face of Christ in the faces of those who are on the underside of our realities of injustice, who know no justice. And that that's where we began to build God's future, just future. When those people can talk about justice and we know there's justice, I don't care someone on the hill talking about justice. It's when those people who know injustice and its rawest forms can talk about justice, we know we're somewhere near it. So how can we place ourselves as institutions doing that kind of ministry? Uh, to how can we as institutions, even across country, uh, we have this wonderful thing called, and we'll say it's wonderful until it's not, uh, this wonderful thing called the internet. Yeah. How can we, the internet mask things uh, that it shouldn't mask, but it also brings us in, can bring us into conversations that we otherwise can't have. How can we as two institutions use that internet? How can we engage? We are a community that uh, EDS at Union that is multi-faith, even in uh, and, 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 and interfaith. So it's all saints, yeah. And, as, and so <laughs> yeah. how can we, these communities come together mm -hmm. in conversation and figure this thing out together? One of the things you uh, announced here uh, just now when we came into the forum and at time of announcements, uh, which I think is wonderful, is your action table, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and so you're trying to be church in the world. You're trying to make the litur liturgy is work, the, the work of liturgy move beyond what goes on at the altar. How can we as EDS and Union become a part of that action table? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. How uh, would love that? How can you help us to know this is where this is the bill that yeah. you guys are trying to support? This is a, put your names to this bill. Put your institution. How can we work? And how can we say to you, we need this? We have a gun resolution. Yeah. How can you join us and partner with us in that? What are the ways in which we can work together to be the body of Christ in the world? And finally, say I think that seminaries. Theological institutions, I take this from a theologian named Karl Barth. Uh, and Karl Barth says, one, that you need to keep the newspaper in one hand and the gospel in the other. That would be the cross. And the uh, other thing he says is that seminaries ought to be the self-test, or not seminaries, the theologians ought to be the self-test of the church, theology the self-test of the church. I think seminaries have to be that mm -hmm. uh, for faith communities. And that's what this dialogue could be all about. How can we... Help, help each other be accountable mm -hmm. to our call in the world. So how can we do that? <laughs> yeah, and, and so a couple of thoughts on, and I know we're close on time, um, but I can't just leave you hanging there because I got to give you sort of my thoughts on this because this is great. Um, and particularly I think about how we can work together. So a couple of things strike me. First is uh, something that you said uh, yesterday, which is we got to go back to our own story. Uh, one of the things we're doing, and we've started it as a Vestrian staff, and we're going to expand it to the congregation, is really looking at what are our core values, what are our foundational values, um, and, and claiming those. But then also, and then also telling the story of, okay, when did we live into those, and when did we not? Mm -hmm. And we started talking about what's the story we tell ourselves about ourselves um, that really is aspirational, but that really, I mean, there, there's some honesty that needs to happen. And again, it's not about shame. Um, it's about, yeah, let's be honest so we can grow and be liberated from that which has bound us. 
Uh, so I think part of the opportunity that we have working for these institutions that were shaped and continue to be shaped by whiteness is, first of all, do what you did yesterday and today, which is go back and let's tell the story. Uh, and and let's, let's look at how we can not let that... Let's, let's start writing a new story. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that strikes me is so much of what you are saying, um, I have heard Becca Stevens say, um, working with Thistle Farms and working with... Uh, women who've come off the streets and, as she said, li living in the underside of bridges mm -hmm. um, and getting the backside of humanity. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and Becca talks about all you really need to do in community is just put, just put uh, justice and love at the center yep. and everything takes care of itself. And, and so I, I think the more we can find, uh, you know, Margaret Wheatley, who our senior warden has introduced me to, is an amazing poet and, and author, um, talks about maybe our best opportunity right now is to create islands of sanity amidst the chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a great opportunity for us to find each other. Yeah. So if you're working on this at Union and Becca's working on this at Thistle Farms and we're working on this at, uh, at All Saints Church and I'm sure there's others out there and we don't like forget the boundaries of the Episcopal Church. This is all hands on deck. Um, how can we connect with each other and love each other and support each other and become uh, greater together? And I'm, I'm interested in us keeping this going. No, exactly. Uh, exactly, exactly. And, and I think that we can model mm -hmm. and we should model. And let's figure out a way to do that. Yeah. You, what it looks like as these two institutions come together. What ought to be the relationship between, you know, uh, uh, the church and the seminary. What ought to be? What does it look like to be the body of Christ in the world? What does it look to? to be to, cro to overcome the borders that separate us and, mm -hmm. and to bring uh, our work together with the other groups. I'm anxious to talk about that and to find ways to stay in dialogue. And you and I talked before about uh, this congregation sharing in book reads that we do. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's easy to do. Yeah. Uh, and to consistently work together th on these issues that matter. Mm. Uh, and so I think the, the first step is to be committed. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I committed to continue to be in this kind of dialogue, mm -hmm. but to be committed as institutions, uh, to stay in this conversation, and to work together in relationship with one another so that we know what you're doing, you know what we're doing, and let's try to move together as institutional forces. Yeah. And I think we have to do that, uh, Mike, as well in our church. Mm -hmm. And to be the uh, moral voice, brave voices, not, not necessarily equating that with always the right voices, mm -hmm. but at least asking questions. You know, there are plenty of opportunities to call our church to account for itself. Uh, and, you know, some coming up very quickly in terms of Lambeth, et cetera. It would uh, be nice to have kind of institutional support uh, to begin to call some of these things, uh, our church, into account to mm -hmm. the things that it claims to believe. Uh, and so to be committed, you and I together, mm -hmm. uh, to model that as institutions and to model that as an unlikely pair of a, a black woman and a white man mm -hmm. uh, struggling to find a way to come together. I'm up for it. You up for it? <laughs> we got it. Okay. <laughs> Kelly Brown Douglas.